in here? It's usually cold, but uh, it does feel a little warm. So loosen up your collars there, all of you who wore ties. And... Oh, okay. <laughs> ah. Let's open our Bibles this morning to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. What an exciting chapter, or next couple of chapters. These are I've entitled The Message, The Olivet Discourse, Part 1. That's exactly what this is. As Jesus gave message to his disciples on the Mount of Olives just before his arrest and crucifixion. I've also given it a subtitle, The Beginning of Sorrows. Jesus has just spent a very long day answering the challenges of the religious leaders and finally addressing them with a series of strong rebukes in chapter 23 because of their misrepresentation of God, misrepresentation of His Word, and misrepresentation of His grace. And so Jesus really came down very heavy and very strong uh, on them in chapter 23. It was his last public message uh, to um, basically uh, the religious leaders and uh, to those in general. He now will leave the temple area and head out to the Mount of Olives to be alone with his disciples. And we read in verse 1 of chapter 24, we'll read through verse 14, and hopefully we'll make it through there today. And then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all of these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And of the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all of these must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginnings of sorrows. And then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. And then many false prophets will arise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And this is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Father, we do ask that you would bless, Lord, as we've gathered here today, Lord, to study your word together. We pray, Lord, that you will anoint your word, Lord, and that you will give us ears to understand, Lord. This is not an easy passage of scripture, these next uh, couple of chapters. And so, Lord, I pray that you give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say and that we would be able to feed, Lord, upon these things and be encouraged and challenged in our walk with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. They're leaving the Temple Mount area, and it's interesting that the disciples point out the temple to him. Uh, I find this kind of interesting because, uh, you know, as if, you know, Jesus hasn't really taken note and, and uh, viewed the temple before, but it's like they want to, you know, give him his own little special tour and point out and make sure that he sees the temple. Now remember, Jesus has just spoken to the scribes and the Pharisees, saying to them that your house is left desolate unto you. We read that in the last chapter. And quite frankly, uh, this was unimaginable to the disciples. The word uh, literally means is going to be left empty. 
And they cannot understand this. They, 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 it's, it's as if they're showing him this building that has just been completed. This is Herod's temple, and he, uh, he built the temple. The, uh, the one that was built after the Jews returned from Babylon really left them kind of uh, just a, it was a very small building. And this was a very large and elaborate building that, that actually Herod wanted to build for them to be able to, uh, to worship the Lord in and, and all. And, and it had just been finished. Just, uh, just completed. But they're asking him almost saying, Lord, can you really mean that, 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 that this temple is going to be desolate? That it's going to be unusable? That it's going to be empty? And Jesus answered them saying in verse 2, Do you see all these things? And he was probably looking there at the temple as they were trying to show it to him. And he said, Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus is speaking prophetically to them now. The temple structure was doomed. It wasn't the house of God anymore. It wasn't the place where God uh, was represented and, and, and where His presence was. Uh, it was a mockery, basically. Now, the actual mockery to God and, and to His Word and, and to His way... The actual fulfillment of what Jesus is saying here, this prophecy, would take place 40 years later when Titus besieged Jerusalem in 70 A.D. The Jews had been inspired to rebel against Rome, and he was sent there by, Titus was sent there by his father uh, to, to put down uh, the uprising and the rebellion. And uh, it's interesting that uh, when they surrounded the city, uh, the Jews began to take refuge and they, and they went into the temple. And then uh, Titus surrounded the temple area. And we're told that thousands upon thousands of Jews who had taken refuge in the temple were actually massacred there when a soldier... Uh, trying to get the people to come out, uh, shot a, a fiery arrow into the temple, and it set the whole temple uh, up on fire. Uh, the building had a lot of gold in it. Uh, it was elaborately done. And because of the extreme heat generated by the fire, all of the gold melted. And so Titus told his soldiers then, uh, after it was all done, uh, to go and throw down every stone, what for? The purpose of gathering the gold from the temple uh, that had melted. And so this prophecy was fulfilled completely in A.D. 70. It's almost incredible to think what happened. Josephus writes that when you saw the destruction of Jerusalem after the Roman army left, that it was even unimaginable that anyone ever inhabited the place. I mean, that was what the destruction really amounted to. As far as this temple structure, uh, it was awesome. Uh, I do have some pictures, and I didn't bring them. I should have brought them with me today. But, I mean, the stones that were used to uh, build the building were massive. Uh, over 100 tons, weigh, weighing 100 tons. Chuck Smith said that it's a mystery. It was an engineering marvel just to see how these stones could have actually been put in place. And it's almost as, uh, as unimaginable also to see how they were torn down for these stones weighed so much. But so it was, even as Jesus said, the temple was doomed. Not one stone would be left upon another and it would be torn down even as our Lord prophesied. And now this brings us to the heart, to the beginning of the Olivet Discourse, given to his disciples in response to three questions. His disciples asked him, Three questions. Notice in verse 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things will be. One, two, and what will be the sign of your coming? Three, and the end of the age. To understand what we have here and the application as it means to us and pertains to us today. We have to understand the questions, but also 
the primary focus of Jesus' answer. Otherwise, prophetically, we're going to be all over the board trying to make things apply to the church that don't have any application to the church at all. And chapters 24 and 25 are going to be very, very confusing. I'm going to say to you this morning that these chapters are primarily Jewish in nature. They do not specifically pertain to the church nor do they pertain to the church age. Can we apply some of the principles and, and are things applicable here, the principles that we see of some of these things that Jesus says to us and to our time? Yes, but we certainly have to understand uh, you know, what, it really, uh, what they really do mean to us and we'll kind of go through that as we, as we approach some of these things. But these things remate, uh, relate primarily to the Jews and to the end of the age and when they can expect their Messiah to come. Okay? Notice the first question. It has to do with the destruction of the temple. Tell us when these things will be. Now that doesn't have anything to do with us, does it? We don't worship in a temple and it doesn't have really anything to do with us at all. Interestingly, for whatever reason, Matthew does not include the answer to this question in his gospel. You can find the answer to this question, though, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. Luke does um, address answering this question. Matthew does, however, record the answer to the other two questions. And this gets into a very significant message now. You remember that Jesus has just poured his heart out over Jerusalem. We read that in verse 37 of chapter 23. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and, the stone, uh, and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children. He's talking about Jews. He's talking about his people who have rejected him and turned him away. He's wanted to gather your children together, he says, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. He's pouring his heart out over his people. He wants them and wishes and prays, and it's his heart's desire that they would respond to him. But we know that he came to his own, and his own received him not. These things have to be on the mind of the disciples as they ask him their questions. When would Messiah come to reign? And what would be the signs in the time of the end? They still have in their thought processes the Messiah coming to establish his kingdom on earth and them reigning with him at that moment. This is what's on the mind of the, of the disciples at this particular time. The disciples didn't know anything about the church, nor did they know anything about the church age. They were asking Jesus something that pertained to them as Jews. They wanted to know the signs of the Messiah coming and the end of the age when he would establish his kingdom there in Jerusalem, when he would sit upon the throne of David, and when he would reign and rule from Jerusalem. What age then are they asking him about? What are they talking about? As we understand this, it's also going to help us in our understanding you know, of this as being what I said, primarily directed to the Jews and the end of the age, particularly the tribulation period. The word age, and if you have a King James Bible, you'll find that it's translated world in the King James Bible. 
But really what it means is a period of time when man's rebellion against God is brought under control. When God is ruling and reigning and when he is honored and glorified on earth when his earthly kingdom is established. It doesn't mean the end of the world. It doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is when will man's rebellion against you come to an end? Or against God, and when will Messiah come to reign? To these disciples, the Jews, they had two ages in mind. They had the age in which they were living at the present time, and then they had the age of when Messiah would come and rule and reign upon the earth. Those are the two ages that they had in mind. They weren't thinking about the church age. They weren't thinking about that period of time between these two ages. They weren't thinking about this time in which we are living now when both Jew and Gentile come to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. They don't even know that this age is about to begin in almost 50 days, because it would begin at Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover when Jesus Christ was crucified as the Lamb of God. Now we've been reading about this time in our study uh, in Acts, as we've been in Acts on Wednesday night, actually not in the book of Acts per se, but as we've been doing our study on the baptism with the Holy Spirit, we've been reading about uh, this particular time. At this age... By the way, the church age will last for an unspecified amount of time. For no man knows the day or the hour in which the Lord will come and when his church will be raptured. And so from Pentecost to rapture is what we believe is that time, that time period of the church. The rapture will be the end of the church age and then the time of the end that they're speaking of here will begin. But to the Jew living in that day, the church age was not even a consideration. It, they didn't, it wasn't even a consideration. What was was the two ages that they had in mind, the one in which they were living at the present time and the one when Messiah would come and would reign. They actually believed, however, though, that that end time, that, that, that second age, was uh, about to begin and was about to take place. And that's why they're asking Jesus these, these questions. They want to know, well, when, when will the end come and when will Messiah uh, reign? They want, they want to know that their Messiah has come to put down the persecution that, they, that has, been, uh, has come upon them from Rome. And they want Jesus to say, just hang on just a little bit longer, guys, because it's not going to be long and I am going to come and establish my kingdom. But he didn't say that. And in answering his questions, he said that Israel would be suffering and they would be suffering a whole lot more before the end of the age would come. And so in these chapters, chapters 24 and 25, we're really not concerned with the church and the church age. It's not a part of the age in which Jesus is talking about primarily. Uh, but he's thinking of, or he, he is talking about, the, the end, actually the last seven years of world history. Now let me, I'm going to mention a couple other verses uh, as we go along. We'll elaborate more on those, but just to show you that. When Jesus says, um, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. We have that in verse 13. That's not really a gospel concept. No matter what you might think about that, that's not a gospel concept. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4, he says there, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, I don't want to go off chasing whether or not a person can lose uh, their salvation. I believe when a person is saved, the gift that God gives to us is eternal life. And if it appears that somebody lost it along the way, then the question that I have to ask is, were they ever saved to begin with? But enduring to the end will be the case for those who are saved during the tribulation period. And it will be tough. Look at verse 14. 
And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. And so it may seem like that's happening right now with all of the technology that we have and, and how it seems like the gospel is just being taken, uh, you know, to every corner of the world. But I think that Jesus has something uh, far different in mind, and we'll see that in a minute. In verse 15, he says, and we'll get to that next week, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, we need a rebuilt temple for this to happen. Uh, so we know that this is future. We also need an Antichrist. And if my understanding of eschatology is right, though these things can happen, and though there are uh, plans uh, in the works right now for the rebuilding uh, of the temple, I believe that when we, if we start to see that happen, then I believe the church is soon to be out of here if I understand uh, prophecy and eschatology uh, properly according to the word. Um, so I, I believe that those things all show us that these things are really not for our age, but they are uh, for a future time. So keep that in mind. Keep those things in mind as Jesus answers their questions about the sign of the Messiah coming and the end of the age. Those two things. The focus is on Israel and the age that will usher in the Messiah's earthly reign. And that will be at the end of the last seven years of world history as we know it today, even as we read and commented on last week from the book of Zechariah, when Jesus will come with ten thousands of his saints, and he will come and touch down upon the Mount of Olives, and it will split in two. And from there on, you know, he will put his enemies under his feet. So what do we read here? So Jesus continues saying in verse 4, Take heed that no one deceives you. He wants them to understand, understand what he's saying. What a warning to the Jews. And what a warning to the Jews of the day in which he is referring here. It's a warning, yes, to all, to all the world. But primarily, it's a warning to the Jews. Why? Because I believe they will, well, I don't believe, I know, they will be caught up in the greatest deception that has ever been brought upon man when this world leader of the end times arises and they will receive him as their Messiah. They'll fall for this man hook, line, and sinker. They will embrace him and he will embrace them. He will gain their trust and they will believe indeed that he is the Messiah. It's interesting that the Bible actually teaches that the first half of that seven-year period of world uh, history known as the, the, the tribulation, that the first half of the tribulation period, things are actually going to be going along pretty good for the Jews. As the Antichrist, as he is so called, embraces them, he will help them to uh, rebuild their temple. He will give them the place of worship. And uh, things will really be going along pretty smoothly for them. But it will be soon, three and a half years into it, as Jesus speaks about in, chat, in verse 15, which doesn't really pertain to us right now, but in three and a half years into that period of time, they will find out that they have been duped and that they have been deceived. And the Bible describes this in Jeremiah as a time of Jacob's trouble, a time that has been unlike any period in world history uh, to come upon the Jews as far as persecution goes. But the warning, beware, beware of these false teachers that will arise. Take heed that no one deceives you. Be aware. And be warned now of the deceptions and the false hopes and the false promises that come from the false teachers claiming to be Messiah. Verse 5, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. A sign that the end of the age and the coming of the Messiah will be near is that many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. It's interesting that before 
Jesus Christ was born, there weren't really any that made uh, this proclamation that claimed that they were Messiah, at least that we know of. But since him, there have been many. And he says that there will be many, many more culminating in the one who will claim to be Christ, who will claim to be him uh, in the end times, uh, the Antichrist. And so uh, this should be a sign to us today as we're seated here. This should be a sign to us, the church, that the end is really near because we are seeing more and more people uh, come on even with their, with their false claims uh, of Messiah. And I believe that God is casting a shadow of prophecy upon this generation and upon this time so that we can really sense how close the end really is. How near the end really is. You know, I believe that the end, when, it, when the beginning of the end happens, it's going to happen in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Because when the church is raptured, and Jesus says that will come in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, from that moment on, then I believe the clock starts ticking away the last seven years of world history. But this is a sign that is so important that Jesus repeats it two other times in this chapter. In verse 11, he says, And many false prophets will arise and deceive many. In verse 24, he says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, the very elect. And so as the time moves on, this is going to heat up. And there are going to be more and more and more of these people, false messiahs. And let me tell you something. They're not all going to be weirdos. Well, they are, <laughs> but they're certainly not going to appear to be. They're going to appear to be sharp people. They're going to appear to be believable. Elsewise, they wouldn't be able to deceive anyone. Hi, I'm here to deceive you. Okay, go away. I don't want to bother, you know. They're not going to come on like that. They're going to come on as if they are speaking the truth, but they will be speaking lies. We know that it really doesn't take much to deceive people today. It doesn't take much to deceive people. How many have come along in recent years? And how many people have bought in to those who have come along making those false, uh, false claims of Messiah? I, I, re I remember, and I'm sure that a lot of you remember several years ago, the full-page ads that were taken out in the major newspapers around the country. This fellow, Benjamin Krem, took these papers, took these advertisements out saying, The Messiah! The Messiah is here! Maybe a false Messiah, but not the Messiah. Uh, he, he may be, the false Messiah may very well be, and I believe he is alive today. But... Uh, uh, there was just one person there making a claim, you know, the Messiah uh, is here. Uh, then came along the, 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 the New Age, and I will call them weirdos, because I believe that the New Age theology and those who embrace it, you know, uh, is embraced by a bunch of weirdos. They're out there, literally. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the people I pray for, their theology is stupid. Um, some of them so far out there that went two years ago, you know, we had to really redirect our message because these guys thought they wanted to catch up on the Hale Bob Comet, you know, right around this time, right around Resurrection Sunday. Part of the New Age theology and part of the uh, New Age uh, philosophy, they thought that they were going to hasten along the coming in, really, of uh, the, new, uh, the New Age. Um, but uh, this, this New Age a theology that's out there. Basically what their theology says, who needs a Messiah? You can be God yourself. All you have to do is awaken that God consciousness within and you can be Him. And you remember Shirley MacLaine. She, got, she was one of the first ones to really lead. This. She gave it, I, I don't, I, I mean, you know, some people think that because some actor or some musician or some, uh, you know, movie star, some prominent person, you know, steps up and, and begins to talk about some of these things that it lends some kind of credibility to them. And, you know, she wrote a book called Out on a Limb. That ought to say something right there about Shirley MacLaine. Surely, she is deceived. 
Look at the deception going on within the Christian cults, I'll call them. And the people that have given up all to follow some of these people. Jim Jones, David Koresh, our local name, it, name to fame, Kim Miller. These people that are following these people. How many others? Reverend Moon. This guy's got a huge following and deceiving many. There have been others. When I became a Christian, I was warned about the children of God. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that cult. Uh, a guy named David um, Moses. Moses David, I can't even remember now. But uh, basically what his cult was, it was a sex cult for him to prey upon young girls, young women. Um, so we were warned about them. But, these, but people, you know, people were ready to grab on to these cults. It should break our heart that they reject the truth. God help us with our witness. God help us with our coming alongside others to tell them the truth. God help us that they would believe.
famine in some of in India, or when we see the famines in in Africa and in, in the desert countries uh, uh, or areas of the world and all. But when Jesus says that these are going to be taking place in divers places, in places that we never even imagined, they won't be protected any longer. Place no place on the face of the earth will be immune, and all we have to do is to read the book of Revelation. From chapter 6 to chapter 18, to see that these things are going to uh, uh, just escalate uh, during this last seven-year period of world history. Um, as far as the increase of these things, hey, it's very clear from uh, the World Hunger Organizations, from the National uh, Center for Disease Control, uh, the statistics on earthquakes, all of these things, all of these things are beginning to uh, multiply uh, at an alarming rate. Uh, and all of these are significant. They're significant to us today as God cast the shadow of prophecy out upon us that the end that Jesus spoke about is near. And so uh, uh, we'll just move on. He says that all of these things, verse 8, are the beginnings of sorrows. The word for sorrows is birth pangs. And indeed the world is having some contractions right now but I don't believe that it's nearly uh, as severe and intense as the day of delivery. And uh, you know what I mean by that. These are the beginnings of sorrows, the beginnings of, birth, uh, of the birth pangs. And Jesus says that they will intensify to the point uh, that it's just going to be incredible. I, I believe uh, these are the things that will really be happening as we read about the first three and a half uh, years of the tribulation period when the seals of, of, revelation, uh, of revelation there are broken open. Uh, we, see, we see the stage being set for these things now, uh, but uh, I don't believe that we're really seeing them to the degree that uh, they will be uh, in the time that Jesus is spe uh, speaking about. Uh, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And I don't believe that the church uh, will really see these things as they are being spoken about uh, here to this degree. But it should give cause enough for us to know that the end is near just by looking at the things that we even see as the shadow of, of his prophecy is, is coming up over us. Uh, verse 9, They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Who is the you that he's talking about here? You may think that that's you because of the persecution that... Uh, as a Christian that you receive in the world today, but I don't think so. I, I, I think that Jesus is certainly talking about the Jews. He's talking about the Jews and the nation of Israel as the tribulation unfolds. In that day, the persecution in the Jew will be nothing like they have ever experienced before in their existence. How do we know what he says here? He says they will stand alone that all nations will be against them. Israel still has a little bit of support. Some allies today, but that support is dwindling. But in that day, they will have none. In that day, they will stand alone. He says in verse 10 that many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. And so the support that... Israel has had will be gone. Agreements that were made will be broken. Israel will be betrayed by her allies that once stood beside her. And once again, verse 11, many false prophets will arise up and deceive many. Not only will there be those who arise and justify turning against the support of Israel and, and, the, and, and the encouragement to pull out and stand against them, but there is going to be more dissension from within. And we even see that happening today in Israel. We see those that are willing to compromise the land and give the land uh, over to the Arabs that God promised to them. And then we have the conflict within. And so I believe that this is going, that, that, you know, many will be offended and will be betrayed. And I believe that this significantly goes within the nation of Israel. And there will be many false prophets who will get on one bandwagon or on the other. And they will rise up and deceive many. And as the last years of the end times unfold, 
Those nations and people, though, that did turn their back on Israel will be judged. They'll be judged severely for their actions in turning against them. Verse 12, Jesus says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. A moral sign that the end is near. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Do we see this sign happening today? Yeah, we do. Where evil is called good, and good is called evil. If that's not enough, why don't you compare Second Timothy chapter 3 as he describes things that will be going on as the last days begin to unfold. And if you think that we're there, well, the stage is only being set for total apostasy and rebellion against God and His standard of righteousness in Jesus Christ. He says the love of many will grow cold because lawlessness abounds. How men look at sin. How men look at God. In the last days, will there be a growing love for God? No. There will be a, love, a growing love for self. Will there be a growing love for His righteousness? No. But there will be a growing self-righteousness. And many will fall away. Many who once even professed a love for Jesus Christ will turn their back on Him. Why? Because lawlessness abounds and the heart was not really surrendered to him in the first place, as I said earlier on. Look how society today has become so anesthetized to sin. The abuse of alcohol and drunkenness is called a disease now. It's not called sin. Abortion isn't murder. It's a woman's right to choose how to control her own body. Homosexual homosexuality isn't sin it's an alternative lifestyle look at these things that the Bible clearly describes as sin and yet how they've been compromised because lawlessness abounds the love of many will grow cold the love of many the love of the truth and the love of God will be compromised to the point that his truth and his righteousness are ignored and as even we read in the book of Judges every man did that which was right in his own eyes and that's basically you know what's going to happen but there will become that leader will arise who will begin to amass those people to follow him but he who endures to the end Jesus says will be saved and once again I, re I, I really do believe that this has to do with the people who come to saving faith during the tribulation period because it will be an endurance, a persecution, tribulation, heavy. Notice one last sign, the gospel of the kingdom reaching the entire world, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. You know, even with the multitudes of missionaries that we have out there today, and, and some of them claim this verse, we've got to get out there, we've got to get the, the message of the gospel into all the world. And even though they're doing oh, a precious and magnificent job of carrying the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world, um, and the communication technology that we have today is, is, is getting the message of the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. But it hasn't happened to the degree that Jesus says it will happen, and nor do I believe it can. Because there's just places in the world that this isn't going to happen by man's means or by man's skills. But it will happen during the end times. In the last part of the tribulation period, and if you'll turn to Revelation chapter 14, 6, if you don't have your Bible, just look at your Selah this morning. Because it's the same thing. This is how God is going to accomplish what man can't do. It'll be done supernaturally. As John writes in his vision, in the Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, 
He says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That's how God's going to accomplish getting the gospel out to all of the nations of the world. That isn't to put down the the work of the missionaries, and we, we thank God for that calling upon their lives, and the people that they are reaching. But here is, I believe, the fulfillment of what Jesus is talking about in verse 14 of Matthew 24. It's in chapter 14 of Revelation. God's word will be fulfilled and the world will be evangelized, the whole world, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. But right now, maybe our concern ought to be right here. God says that he will get the gospel out to the whole world. But how are we doing? How are we doing in getting the gospel out? Is it our concern for those who are lost and dying to reach them with the gospel, the good news of the salvation of Jesus Christ? That should be first and foremost on our minds as we get up every morning, as we go to work, as we go to school, as we are mowing the grass and our neighbors come out to want to talk to us for a while or when we get a chance to, to work with our neighbors and share with them. God, open these doors. Open the doors that we're able to share the simplicity of the gospel. Oh, Richie, I don't know enough. Well, you should. If you know John 3.16, you know enough. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And you know, so much of the rest of it isn't what we verbalize, but so much of the rest of it is what we communicate through the life and the lifestyle that we live. And you guys know that. Each of you. And I pray that God would pour His Spirit out upon you. That's why we're talking about, once again, the baptism with the Holy Spirit on Wednesday night. That God would pour His Spirit out afresh upon this body of believers. Oh, He didn't have a very big group of people when, when He started. But that little group of people gathered together there in Jerusalem where He told them to wait for the promise of the Father to come upon them when they would be empowered from the Father with the promise of the Father. What? To be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. He didn't say that the Spirit would be poured about on them so they could speak in tongues and prophesy and, and do all of these other things, the gifts of the Spirit. And yes, these things are important. And yes, we do believe in all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we find mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Romans chapter 12. But the first, I mean, the primor, primary purpose of having that, the power of the Holy Spirit come up on us. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not going into those messages that we've been given for the past couple of weeks. Mary can get those for you. But it's the power to be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in our homes and in our neighborhoods, and in Samaria, moving out wherever God takes us. Maybe it's a college student that he takes to another part of the world. That might be somebody's Jerusalem and Judea, but it's your Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. So we have the privilege and the honor, but we can't do it in the energy of our own flesh. And I believe that that's why the witness of so many believers falls flat on its face. Because we do try to do it in the energy of our flesh. Not in the power of the Holy Spirit that has come upon us. And I pray that God would pour His Spirit out upon us. If you want to know more about the baptism with the Holy Spirit, it was interesting as we were giving our message on Tuesday night, I asked how many... How many of the people gathered there had really heard about this experience when they got saved? And not a one raised their hand. I hadn't either. I hadn't heard about it either. But by the grace of God, a wonderful man of God came and shared the baptism with the Holy Spirit with me. And I pray it's having an effect. I pray it's having an effect today. But we have the goods take that gospel out. Let's pray.
Father, as we come before you today, Lord. Father, I don't think there's any of us gathered here who don't sense the days in which we live. Father, I pray that as the shadow of prophecy is cast upon this day and age, the church age, Lord, that we can see that the time and the season, the time of the end and the time when you will come and reign as King of kings and Lord of lords, Lord, the time that the disciples asked you about, oh, that time is very, 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 very near. And Lord, that your return is imminent at any moment. So, Lord, we pray this morning, God, that our witness and our testimony, God, that we would live our lives, Lord, in anticipation of you coming at any moment for your church, for your bride, and then comes the end. Father, I pray that if there are any gathered here with us this morning who have never come into a personal and living relationship with you through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray today, Lord, that today they would not walk out of this building without receiving the gift that you have for them today. It's a gift that Jesus offered. It's a gift that's offered today. It's not anything we can buy. It's not anything we can work for. It's not anything we can earn or be good enough for. It's a gift to be received. That's the gospel, the good news. Have you received the forgiveness of your sin through faith in Jesus Christ? The Bible says that all of sin that comes short of the glory of God it says the wages of sin is death. That means eternal separation from God forever and ever and ever and ever and ever throughout all eternity. But the free gift of God is eternal life forever and ever 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 with God because you have come and received that gift. As the Lord reaches that gift out here among this small gathering today, have you received that gift? The forgiveness of your sin? I pray so. And if not, Will you just lift your hand where you're seated if you want to receive this gift this morning? The gift that Jesus has for you, the gift of forgiveness of sin. Will you just lift your hand where you're seated today that I might pray for you? Anyone at all? Anyone that's joined us at all? Well, Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord. I pray that you give us understanding, Lord, as we continue to study the Gospel of Matthew, as we continue to study these chapters. I pray, Lord, that you give us, God, the understanding that we need, Lord, of the days in which we live, and the times that are before us. Because we know, Lord, that these days are soon to come that you're talking about here to your disciples. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Don't forget to uh, maybe say uh, goodbye once again to Jeff and Kari. Give them a hug. Tell them you love them. You're going to keep them in your prayers. They've blessed you. We hope to see you Come out and join us on Wednesday night as we continue our study in the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And have some times of worship. We'll do that even a little bit differently even than we did last time as we uh, just really draw near to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so we uh, encourage you to come out and join us and, uh, to join those who are gathering together on Friday night at the home Bible studies and for the men's meeting on Saturday morning and also the time of prayer on Tuesday mornings at 6.30. Yes, that's a.m. Hey, we'll see you there.
Thank you.